much for having me here. It's a great opportunity uh, to tell you about what we're up to. So uh, there's a very famous species that went extinct in Tasmania, but there are actually 28 that we know of, and there's a bunch more that we haven't seen for a while. Uh, extinction is a, a serious problem here and around the world. Um, the estimate at the moment is that one million species should at least be listed as seriously, significantly threatened by extinction. Um, and it's thought that somewhere between 0.01 to 0.7% of all species go extinct every year. And that is not normal if you look at the background rate uh, in the fossil record. And also, if you look at any extinctions that we have any information on, you can really track that that is due to us. It's not just a kind of um, natural part of evolution. It, it, it's, it's on us. So it's, it's, it's a worry. And people have been worried about it for a long time. Uh, the Earth summit, summit in the 90s gave rise not only to the Convention on um, Climate Change, but also on biological diversity. Uh, people recognising the value of uh, nature, not only in its contribution to helping tackle climate change, but um, so much more. Flip through any science magazine and you'll see all the values of individual species. Um, and of course, extinction is in itself a threatening event. It leads to the network disintegrating. And we all know how valuable ecosystems overall are to so many different parts of our life. But we also, there are many things that we don't know, both about the value of species and the value of those ecosystems. We don't know it until we've lost them. And we have to scramble to invent the new technology. Uh, so in COP10, in 2010, for example, there were a whole pile of um, HE targets that were um, set out. And one of them was by 2020, the extinction of known threatened species has been prevented and their conservation status, particularly of those most in decline, has been improved and sustained. Yeah, we're not doing very well. <laughs> so what are the barriers? Um, well, I, I got a little insight into that working in the Tasmanian government. And of course, there are lots, but two that really struck me from that position uh, were a lack of information and also a lack of communication of information, leading to limited action and support for threatened species conservation. So what do I mean exactly by that? Well, uh, fewer than 15% of uh, 209 of our threatened fauna that are listed either on the state list or the national list are currently monitored. Uh, we don't actually know what's going on with them, whether they're recovering or continuing to decline. And of course, our threatened, non-threatened species, the ones that we're not paying, yeah, well, they're, they're not monitored at all. So they could be actually, it's possible that they all ought to be listed on the threatened species lists, but we, we wouldn't know. Um, and of course, there are a whole bunch of species that are being discovered right now. Um, literally, I, I hear about more every month, just, you know, oh, well, we, we don't have a name for that. And the legislation is such that if it's not described, then, well, we, we, we probably don't have enough information to be sure whether it should be listed as threatened or not. It certainly, it isn't formally protected if we don't know. There's no precautionary principle in that regard. Um, even if we know quite a lot about the species, we very commonly don't know enough about um, what exactly it needs and where it is. Uh, which means that as a regulator, it's really difficult, even though the legislation is, has goodwill behind it, it's really difficult to protect uh, everything and, and help it recover from its threatened status effectively. Um, yeah, my mantra is that you can't manage what you don't measure. You can't, if you can't see whether you're having an effect uh, or, or what that effect is, it, it, it's not very possible to really make a difference, at least the one you want. The, that lack of communication was the second point I made. Um, so, Typical situation, here you've got Joe Blow who wants to uh, build a house, start up a business, something that involves um, acting in an area where there might be some threatened species, but they're not aware of that stuff. Um, they're really excited about their house or their business or whatever it is, and they get architects or they negotiate teams and get loans and all the rest of it. They're very heavily financially and emotionally invested in this plan. But possibly quite late in the day, they start talking with the regulators and then they finally get all the surveys. 
And perhaps the threatened species issue very commonly emerges just before work starts, the worst time uh, for this to emerge. Um, and that is often because the, the surveys haven't been done before, the information isn't, wasn't there already. So the regulator doesn't want to be down on development, but they're also concerned about threatened species. There's compromise on both sides. It's extra cost, the, nobody wins, and the threatened species gets a really bad name as a development blocker. So when I was in the position as threatened species um, zoologist, I really increasingly was thinking that might be a role for public involvement with the idea that more people means more information and also more people may mean widespread awareness. And I don't just mean like knowing it's a problem as we do absolutely with climate change and the pandemic. We know the science, but is everyone acting? No, they're not. But I know myself when I work on particular research, I'm, I'm engaged, I'm fully concerned. I'm, I'm really interested in the outcome. I'm really annoyed if I found out something and I'm really confident about the outcome and then it's not acted upon. I am fully engaged. So that, that's an attractive reason to involve the public. Um, yeah, if they're involved, they'll understand the science. They're, there's more likelihood that they'll actually trust it, assuming it's good science, um, and there might be enduring support for action. So yeah, I'm talking citizen science. And um, as Dawn mentioned, I did a Churchill Fellowship on that to find out more about how it's working around the world. Um, there's a common sort of feeling when you're a scientist and you just kind of want some data that, uh, that a citizen scientist is some sort of compliant drone that kind of goes out and do simple stuff that you, you want. But of course, that's not the case. It's, it's people. It's just people. And there's some incredibly skilled people prepared to volunteer their time. Our definition is that a citizen scientist is a potential amateur or professional scientist, often learning from and collaborating with others, volunteering their time to conduct scientific work. Um, yeah, and there's some amazing skills out there, of course, as we all know. Uh, we kicked off, uh, once I joined up with uh, the Bookend Trust, with a series of bioblitzes. So what is a bioblitz? It's a concerted effort involving the public to discover and record as many living things as possible within a set location. In our case, it was consistently council reserves that um, we're kind of showing people what was in their backyard pretty much or where they regularly walk the dog or whatever um, over a set amount of time. A 24, 36 hour period was typical. Um, we've done four so far, uh, hundreds of participants, hundreds of species found, mostly new records for each site. We're, we're getting that information. Where are these things? A bit more about where they like their habitats and so forth, what they might need. Um, mostly new records for each site. So um, they're on the left in the domain in that red circle. I've got um, 140 species weren't previously recorded at that site. That's the Hobart domain. It's incredibly well known. And yet we got a whole lot of people just out there looking and suddenly a whole lot more species were recorded. And that included um, the painted button quail, which is a favourite twitch of a lot of bird birders. They really love to see that bird and it hadn't been recorded there. And also an invasive, um, well, an exotic weevil that had never been recorded in Tasmania before. So useful stuff. So coming to the nub of why I'm talking to you is to talk about how we're recording the data for something like the BioBlitz. Uh, and I could bang on about this particular open source software, iNaturalist, for hours. I, I think it's a, a really wonderful resource. Um, so with one button click on your um, phone, uh, you can take the photo, date, time, observer, location. Um, and so there's, there's a rather terrible photo, but you can see that that's what I've uh, been able to record there. And also, um, this has been going on for a long time now. Uh, it's particularly great in the US, but it's getting very good in Australia as well. It's got this amazing database full of photos of commonly photographed species, and therefore it's very good at coming up with automatic suggestions on what you've observed. So this was something I photographed the other day. Um, it's a kind of flower wasp that it's mating. So I was pretty pleased with it, just up by the uni. And um, it's immediately suggested uh, what it might be. And uh, it's actually, it actually tends to be very good at this, amazingly good at, as far as I'm concerned, it's getting the general impression of the, of the, of the animal. Uh, but yeah, 
it's just extraordinary. Um, there's quite a lot of things where, like, to be absolutely sure, you'd need to sort of dissect it, but a lot of expert entomologists would know it from the basic appearance and the location, and it's taking on that sort of ability. So that's a good start. Um, plus, you get expert suggestions on what you've observed, or you might have somebody going, this photo is not good enough that anybody could possibly tell what it was, and that's useful too. So in this case, somebody called Karuna Stylus, uh, who I happen to know really knows her stuff, um, has corrected my um, guess at what this, this um, species was. Uh, and that's super helpful, I'm learning. Uh, so it's, it's a great way to record and share observations. But it's also a lot more. Um, so you can download it all and uh, put it, so this is the, our fourth um, BioBlitz at the Don Reserve. Uh, so the council can use it. It can go onto the government, the Tasmanian government database, the Natural Values Atlas, which is publicly available, and the Atlas of Living Australia. The, the Tasmanian one is, they're very careful what they take on. There's a lot of verification. They can look at the photos themselves, um, but also you can see the little, little green signs on some of these photos, they're research grade. So iNaturalist has got one way of like filtering. Um, it looks at whether the photo is good enough um, for assessing the identification. And then it looks at the, whether there's a certain proportion of identify, identifications that are consistent. And if, if it's all looking good, then it gives it a research grade. But anybody who's using it can use that in a different way. Um, it, it, they might know that there's certain groups that they're working with that, you know, people make typical mistakes and so forth. Uh, but yeah, it's a really comprehensive chunk of data that you can get on your species of interest. Um, of course, as a personal user, you get social input, you get skills training, you get a little list of what you've seen and what people have already told you what they were. I've been hearing for many years, you know, people are talking about recording species, roadkill, you know, we want to see a particular group of, of species. Um, oh, you should write an app for that and great expense and so forth. But an awful lot of what people are writing apps in this area for can be covered by this one, which is extremely well supported and has been going on for a long time. They've got um, 85 million records on there now um, and it's going up a lot every day. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's, that's uh, one way we've been using it, is for the bio blitzes. Uh, but I also want to tell you just briefly a little bit more about what we're doing um, uh, with Citizen Science in the Bookend Trust. Um, so this is uh, a suite of projects uh, under the Nature Trackers program, where we're coordinating schools and the community to track the progress of our threatened species and better understand their needs. Uh, so if you've heard of any of our projects, you may well have heard of our project Where Where Wedgie. Um, uh, it's actually working on all birds of prey in Tasmania and, and the white cockies, the corellas and the soft-crested cockatoos. Uh, but we're really focusing and bringing people in with the wedge-tailed eagles, which we're really concerned about. They're endangered and they're facing a great many threats. We want to know whether the efforts to try and address those threats are effective or not. Um, I won't talk about that too much. We have a wonderful um, tailored app for that, which if you're interested, um, Tim here can tell you all about uh, ESC mapping have, have written that tailored app. Um, wedgies are extremely mobile and we need quite a rigorous um, set of uh, details to really effectively monitor those populations. Um, but uh, it's awesome, uh, but it's a bit challenging for our naturalists to cover. Uh, we certainly get a great deal more from having a tailored app. Um, if you do want to get involved, it's every mid and end May. You can just do it for a, a morning or for two long weekends. Um, so, yes, please check it out, but, uh, and I've got, I've got some field guides here that plug it. I've got a few more over there as well. Um, but I will talk a little bit more about claws on the line, which does use iNaturalist. Uh, again, this is an endangered species. Uh, we have a bunch of burrowing crayfish around Tassie, but these ones are particularly threatened, category endangered. Tiny distribution, suffering from habitat loss. A lot of it's due to people actually building houses and just or, or businesses and just not really realizing that they're present. Um, and it's been a great concern and we're not quite sure what's going on with them now. Um, what you normally see is not that picture of that uh, animal that was captured under permit, <laughs> but you see their burrows, um, which are not necessarily particularly close to a creek. They might be just in the middle of a paddock. And these ones are only known around Devonport, La Trobe, down to Sheffield, Port Sorrel. 
Um, if you smoosh all those together, they're current, the places we know where they are, they're currently known to occupy an area of less than a square kilometre total. Um, so we'd really like to know, are we missing some? It's mostly private land, so that's really challenging. Um, they are quite easily spotted. And, and, it, and is the distribution changing? Are, are we losing them? So we can get people to record where they've seen um, chimneys, these, these burrows, um, which is fantastic. Um, as you'll see in the middle there, um, that geo privacy. So if people are a bit nervous because they're private landowners and they're like, oh, I don't want to tell everyone that I've got a threatened species on my land, um, they can um, set it so that only we uh, who run the project that they're attaching this to can see the location. Um, and as you see down at the bottom there, um, this, this record of mine is, is attached to two separate projects. Once you attach it to a project, in our case, claws on the line, there are some extra fields that I've added so I can get extra information about these particular observations, which is gold. That's what really <laughs> makes it a very useful app from my perspective in this regard. Um, and then, yeah, so we've got lots of lovely pictures which other people can enjoy and feel motivated by, uh, and we can download. Um, and so from that, we're getting um, a map, not only actually of this particular species, but other areas where people are seeing them, which ultimately I hope that we'll investigate other species too. Um, and I've got a student, Wade Bone, who's been starting to map where they're most likely to be. And we might do some more targeted work with some of the interested people to try and get an idea of the densities of these species in particular areas where they're most commonly found. Uh, so hopefully with this effort, it's, it's hard work and it needs a bit more investment in time. We definitely need more people doing this. Uh, but yeah, we're getting more information, engendering trust and helping people plan ahead so that they don't hit that really last minute wall of discovering a threatened species on their land. Uh, so yeah, if you're interested, we're on the socials uh, and we've got lots of videos because Book and Trust is really into environmental education. That's my Twitter handle too. Um, and yeah, thanks to many, many people who are involved with uh, these projects and of course our funders. And I would very happily talk about this for much longer, but thank you very much for the time you've given me. <laughs> yep, burrowing crayfish, yeah, they're just little. Um, yeah, yeah, like um, if you smushed it all together, like because those is little. Bank, no, 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 they're literally just there. Just there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, so the my colleague who um, in the Bookend Trust is the world expert on Tasmanian burrowing crayfish, and he's done a lot of work on them. So there are other burrowing crayfish, um, but this is a particularly threatened one that is particularly localized. It seems strange. Well, it may, yeah, but so that was just um, like over to Port Sorel, um, La Trobe, Devonport. It's still a pretty small area, but there may well be some in between those points. So but we haven't got the data. It is a lack of habitat because uh, so people are building, people are creating cattle paddocks and smushing all the land so that the animals can't live there. It's changing hydrology, but they're literally there's limited habitat. Mm. And so we really need to kind of raise awareness, but also it's quite possible that there are some on private land that people aren't telling us about. So uh, yeah, du double problem. Is it the, the cattle are compressing the the, the right. soil and yeah. preventing the.
Can I just quickly say, like, we've got this model here. So. Um, in general, like we're very alert to a range of threats, but not particularly methane. We can talk about that afterwards. But what I would say is that we've got this preliminary model here, which we're refining, um, which which is on all these sorts of features um, and trying to, uh, yeah, absolutely talk about more about what we should do in that particular one. But we've we've could put in quite a lot of factors. So then we hope to test that model and refine it, um, get people specifically looking in the areas that are most um, promising, like are there any there or if not, then why not? Let's add in a few extra factors in that case. I know, I think they were talking about individuals, but initially the, the, the statement was regarding vertebrates. Um, but then they recently, and I was so pleased to see it, they started talking about invertebrates. Um, and yeah, of course, the numbers have just skyrocketed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it would be fine if, like, we hadn't taken off lots of habitat, but then if you've removed a lot of habitat and then you have a fire and it's worse fire than usual because of climate change, then it just. Mm. So the natural values atlas is the key way of doing that. So they can use it? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. But I mean, they can absolutely, iNaturalist is accessible by anybody, but also unless people have made it private. Um, but the natural values atlas is the standard way that um, councils use. You need to stop, don't you? <laughs> I, do. I mean, I would love it to continue. And I'm just thinking, how can I manage that? But um, yes, thank you so much, Claire. It was great. And I hope people will talk to you if you can stay for lunch. Oh, thank um, you. I realise that you have to go for the stuff too. But yes, if you'd like to uh, join me in thanking Claire, that was a big one.